Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to another episode of It's Our Relative. Thank you so much for joining us once again. For many people, completing their education might mean completing a bachelor's degree and it kind of ends there, myself included. But today here in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, I am joined by a quite brilliant individual who has gone the distance. Muhammad Zahir Ali Mamad is a trained molecular biologist and biotechnologist currently completing his PhD in medical genetics and is on a mission to create awareness about this very upcoming field in science and innovation. Muhammad Zahir, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you. I'm very Thank grateful. you so much, Rizwan, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm a huge fan of your show. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I have to ask, why scientist? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, most people, you know, it's doctor, pharmacist, lawyer, engineer, IT or whatever it is, pilot maybe, but scientist of all things? Right. So, in fact, this is not no coincidence. Up until... <laughs> Form right. 4, which is normally the end of the O-levels here in Tanzania, the yeah. system, the nectar system. Yeah. I was geared up to become a pharmacist. Ah, so, okay. in fact, it was very much conventional pathway for myself. Oh, so it was. It, it was. <laughs> and then okay. I, I came across um, Dr. Daniel Maida, who is, right. of course, uh, a brother figure to me right. and a mentor as well. And he introduced me to the field of biotechnology. Okay. And it was, I remember very well, this was early Form 5, somewhere in, in, in those times. And right. What I realized was the curiosity that it generated to mm. myself. Mm. That, wow, this is something new. Right. I, I had not heard of what biotechnology was. Right. I didn't know what kind of job I was supposed to be at. Right. I didn't know where I end up. But it was because of that curiosity, my curious nature, so to speak, right. that I went the extra mile to read about it. And then yeah. I was like, I want to do this. And right. so the first thing I went back home was to tell my dad, you know, dad, I really want to do this. Right. And I'm very thankful to both my parents to be able to, um, yes. to accept with what I wanted to do and go forward in this. Okay. All right. All right. So, but what exactly does a molecular biologist and biotechnologist, what, what, what does that work right. entail? What, do you, what, what so is it's, it that you do? It's, it's very self-defining. The word itself consists of the definition. Okay. Biotechnology is a combination of biology and technology. Right. What, what is biology? Bi biology is basically the study of living, living Correct. life. Yeah. And within the concept of life, we have cells. That's absolutely right. And yeah. then that could be breaking down into DNA, to proteins, mm, mm. all the molecular stuff. And technology, all, we all know what technology is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Using these high high tech uh, equipment to study those cells. Ah. So biotechnology, yeah. in combination, yeah. can be defined as something where we, we whereby we use technology. Mm to study life, wow. but with a purpose. Subsequently, what we want to accomplish within the field of biotechnology mm. is to be able to take the further step and see how we can increase productivity, how we can increase medical diagnosis, how we can go forward in, into different pathways. So just to break it down into a couple of examples, we have something called agriculture biotech, okay. whereby we are able to now modify crops so um, within the modification process, as you know, for example, in difficult climatic conditions, for example, in, in a desert, right? Right. it's very difficult to grow crops. But we can modify those crops so that they are resistant to drought. Wow. Right. Okay. In other conducive environments, of course, we let it grow in a natural environment. But when there is a component or a factor that diminishes the productivity of a certain crop, that's where the biotechnological I field see, comes okay. into play and comes into rescue. But that's just agriculture biotech. Yeah. We have, of course, medical biotechnology. We have industrial biotechnology. You know, increasing production of enzymes to perform multiple tasks. Interesting. You, you gave us the example of crops. Right. Um, give us, on, on a human level, give us an example. Right. Um, so let me get, get into human genetics for that matter. Right. Right. So into medical, medical biotechnology and human genetics, the human body is made up, of course, from the code of life, which we call DNA. Yes. Now, DNA is made up of 3.2 billion nucleotides. Think of it as a huge library, okay. right? And then within the library, you have certain sections, yes. what we call them as genes. And then within those sections, we have books. Right? Mm. And those books are these building blocks, the nucleotides, and these are arranged. Right. Now, all of those um, sex subsections are connected in our body. 
because right. half of the DNA we get it from our mother and half of it we get it from our father so whatever they are carrying the books that they have in those shelves are passed on to us and of course we pass it on to our offspring Correct. now if we already understand what kind of mutations so what kind of nucleotides already are passed on we can not only predict what kind of disease susceptibility do we have mm. but also uh, produce ways in which we can combat those issues I see. find ways to produce better drugs early diagnosis for preventive measures and so on and so forth so this is sort of a very very brief introduction right. as to how biotechnology and specializing into human genetics can have an influence on the overall health of the society it's it's, it's really amazing um, I, i'm sure uh, people watching might be wondering what educational path you right. took so let's right. backtrack a little bit sure. and tell us your undergrad your masters sure. now you're doing your phd right. just shed some light right. on that sure <clears throat> so i did my bachelor's in biotechnology at uh, manipal university okay um and of course when i started that's india off, right that's india yeah. right yeah. and when i started off my my bachelor's i had no clue i wanted to do a master's Mm. Neither did I know I was going to do a PhD. Right. So just for the audience, it is not necessary to really outline your career pathway from the that very beginning. That early, yes, right. yes. Okay. Sometimes it's really learning as you go. As you go, right? yeah. So during my internship, um, the biotechnology program um, consisted of six to eight months in, in of, India. In India. Yeah. Um, it required me to conduct a research with my supervisor whereby I studied antimicrobial resistance on diabetic patients but with wounds so foot mm -hmm. ulcers mm -hmm. and what we were able to study was that patients with diabetes uh, especially where these wounds take place of course we know that patients with diabetes have a relatively slow method to um, sort of close their wounds right and we were able to find out certain types of bacteria within those wounds were resistant to antibiotics now why is this so important it is very important to understand that the last family of new generation antibiotics was found back in the 1960s and 70s. Ever since then, the human generation, the humankind, has not been able to find a new family of antibiotics. And of course, the way that the bacteria evolve, they find mechanisms in which they can incorporate new genetic modifications to their bodies so that they are able to, to, to formulate resistance mm. to those antibiotics. And this is so important to us, yeah. which is why I usually try and advocate for people to not normally take antibiotics at their first instant. Right. Because the, the first time a symptom occurs, it, could, it is not necessary that it is caused by a bacterial infection. It could be a viral infection. Right. Now, what are you doing by taking antibiotics to treat a viral disease? It doesn't work. Right. So it is so important to get yourself tested before you can actually start mm. an antibiotic dose. Secondly, people who start antibiotic dosage, they end up um, stopping the dosage at day second or day three True. because they sort of feel better. The symptoms are gone. Correct. Right. And that also creates a huge problem because you're feeding the bacteria with those specific drugs, but you're not feeding them enough to kill all of them. Ah, so there's always some remnants that will then develop resistance by genetic modifications to their bodies right. so that now they will produce new bacteria that are already resistant to the antibiotics. And all this was during your undergrad? This was during my wow. undergrad, right. <laughs> and from that point on, yeah. there was no looking back. I, I already knew I wanted to get into research. No more pharmacy. No more pharmacy. <laughs> I, I, yeah. um, I thought, well, right, this could be a right time to do a master's program, right? right? Now, think of it this way. Biotechnology is an umbrella program. This is like a general MBBS program, right? Um, and then you have to sort of specialize into emergency medicine, pediatric medicine, oncology, and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so the same way, the same principle applies. Biotechnology is a very, very wide umbrella sort of program that provides any student the necessary skills whether mm -hmm. it is theoretical knowledge, conceptual knowledge, or laboratory background, laboratory training, to be able to choose what kind of field that a person wants to specialize in. This is where I decided to get into molecular biology. Some people can get into microbiology. Some people get into virology. Some people get into clinical embryology. 
oncology. And so the, the opportunity to specialize via a master's program is also yeah, endless, is right? Broad, yeah. But this is where sort of your niche comes into it. You have to sort of decide your career pathway. You have to decide what interests you, how are you going to make use of that program, Correct. and what really you want to do in the future, right? Mind you, when I decided to do molecular biology, I was still not sure if I wanted to do a PhD. I just right. knew I wanted to do molecular biology because the study of molecules, the study of genes, the study of really tiny particles at the size of a nano, nano size. So this is 10 to the power minus 9. Wow. That was fascinating. Absolutely. We, we always talk about cell cultures that we are visible to the eye, right? We look at, for example, malaria tests. We look mm. at the cells, the plasmodium. We see them on the microscope. You know, for me, it was very, very fascinating to see something that we're only thinking from an abstract level. Mm. Because the human eye cannot see something at the power of minus 9. It's not possible. Right? Wow. But imagine the power of these things that can influence how we are running life, how we are running healthcare systems, how we are running our education. And so that was my sort of inspiration to get into molecular biology. Of course, at this point, I was very much in contact with my mentor, my role model, Professor Karim Manji, who also happens to be my father-in-law. Wow, what um, a combination. Right. <laughs> and, and, and of yeah. course, he was like, you know, um, he, he engraved in, in me these three principles that I live by. Um, that's um, perseverance, focus, and hard work. Of course, it, it, saying these three things, it's, it's very much cliche. You know, one, one can say, well, of course, everybody says this. Yeah. What does it really mean? Um, and and I'll, I'll get to this when I talk about my, my PhD route. Right. So as soon as I finished my uh, master's in molecular biology, I was already in the Netherlands at the time. And I was like, well, you know what? So, I, so sorry, you did the master's in, I did my in master's, Netherlands? Yes, okay, so okay. at the University of Groningen in, right. in the Netherlands. Okay. And the University of Groningen is the top 100 universities in the world. Wow. So okay. getting there was already a huge I step for myself. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so as soon as I was done with my master's program, and then I decided, well, okay, this is probably a right time for me to do a PhD after consulting with a lot of people, a lot of mentors, um, talking with my supervisor back in the Netherlands, um, and of course, personal interest, right? And it took me 300 applications wow. to finally land my PhD position. Wow. So someone may think, well, it's easy. Well, it's not. Mm. You need to constantly persevere. And this is where I talk about perseverance. Right. Persevering is not a cliche term. Perseverance really means not to give up, right? right. In your head, if you do 15 applications, 20 applications, and then you say, well, that's it for me. Perhaps PhD is not meant to be. Which probably most people that feel that way. Very yes. much the case, right? <laughs> right. And they stop. But if you persevere and you apply and you apply and you apply, it took me eight months, 300 applications later, to land my PhD position. Wow. So that's perseverance, right? And just not to give up. And this was something that was instilled in me by my, uh, my mentor. Correct. At the same time, during my PhD, so talking more about my, my PhD experience, so I look at the clinical applications of next generation sequencing to, to diagnose genetic disorders. And next generation sequencing basically is a machinery that is able to sequence all the 3.2 billion nucleotides that we talked about yeah, uh, in the yeah. DNA you know, on a multiple parallel fashion. So wow. multiple patient DNA can be accumulated and then you sequence sort of all these patients and create it into a certain database where you can start analyzing the data to see the difference between the nucleotides, so those building blocks, right. between patients and normal people. Wow. Because eventually, you need to understand how different a patient with a certain disease is from a, from a person who, is, who doesn't have that disease, right? Correct. To be able to understand where the change Absolutely. occurred. Yeah. And when we talk about the subsections in the library, these subsections have a certain role to play with the molecular processes that happen in the body. Correct. And so these mutations have an influence on the protein production. They have an influence on how a person reacts to a drug. They have an influence right. on how a person will benefit from a drug. And so that's why it's so important to understand the whole DNA structure of any person. Amazing. Right? It, it's so fascinating. I, I, I could sit with you all day and all night and we still wouldn't be done. But um, this path that you took, the one undergrad, master's, PhD, Obviously, it comes at a cost. Sure. I mean, it's not cheap. Sure. I can only imagine. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about the costs and sure. how you were able to facilitate your journey? Right, right. So, I mean, there, there's, there's not a single answer to this. Mm -hmm. um, and it really depends on where a person comes from um, and the journey that one takes. Right. So I'll tell you what I did. Um, I happen to have a little bit of luck, a little bit of good grades, a little bit of support from my father. Um, I managed to land a couple of scholarships and I was able to um, benefit from something called the Africa Federation Education Loan from our Jamaat. Okay. And I really want to stress on this particular point because it is so important that um, we have to appreciate and realize this facility that's available to us, especially the Ishnashri uh, right. students yes. um, throughout Africa. And, 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 you know, proudly saying that, that I was also one of those recipients who's, who is able to complete my education Jamaat loan on time. And I stress on this particular point is because the amount of money that is given to us is based on a rolling basis. Mm, right? Okay. So I was able to receive the education fund uh, as a loan is because somebody before me was able to pay back. Ah, to pay it back. And that okay, allowed me to get the money. And so if I make the effort to pay back that money and therefore my younger brother or my son or somebody else's younger brother or son will be able to benefit from that money because it's on a rolling basis. That is an amazing way to look right. at it. I don't right. I think very few people look at it that way. Sure. Um, Which is why I really want to take this opportunity no, on your no, show I, to, I, to sort of I, advocate I'm, people to pay back their loan. I, I am I'm glad you you brought it up. Uh, this is this is an excellent way of, right. of looking at it. Right. So it, it's a continual so, uh, the cycle, I guess. Sure, uh, sure. And it, know, it secures the future of the community, at, absolutely, at least, absolutely. right? Absolutely. But of course, you know, for me, it worked out that I had scholarships. I had the loan right. from, from the Jamaat. Um, I had funding support from my father. Yes. Um, I had the grades and I had the luck. And you had right? the luck. So it was right. a, a bit of everything A put, bit of everything that together. comes into a pot, right? Right. But not everybody can get this kind of, um, sort of get this kind of lucky. Yes. And therefore... That's not the end. I know far more superior and more learned scholars from Dar es Salaam who come from um, underprivileged places. Ah, okay. Who did not have the Jamaat loan? Interesting. Who did not have okay. their father's money? Who okay. did not have the, the scholarship? Yes. Right? Um, but they were persistent, they worked hard, and they were focused. So what they did was um, to complete a bachelor's yeah. at the University of Dar es Salaam yes. or any other local institution. Yes and then join a university here in, in Dar es Salaam as a tutorial assistant or as an assistant lecturer if they have completed a master's program which is also available in Tanzania. Correct. And following that, it is very important for people to understand that there are multiple opportunities that come to universities in, in Tanzania. So talking about a few, there's the Sokoini Agriculture University, there's the, the Dar es Salaam University College Education, there's the Muimbili University, there's mm. the University of Dar es Salaam. These are recognized institutions in Tanzania that multiple collaborators from abroad and from Africa um, come to us to ask for potential collaboration for multiple projects. Right. And when these collaborative projects are into place, people um, have opportunity to conduct PhD studies, whether it is a sandwich program, so doing a two-year program here in Tanzania, followed by a two-year program elsewhere, or doing the entire four-year program here. And so my advice to, to, to those kind of people is that yeah. um, it, it's not necessary that you have to go via my pathway or it is not necessary for you to be really rich right. to be able to, you know, let's say, self-fund your, your, right. your education. But there are many ways, you know, there, there's a very famous saying that there are many ways to roam, right? Yeah. You don't, you yeah. don't have to just stick to one <laughs> conventional pathway. Absolutely. Right. So this no, is I'm, what I would, I'm glad I would, you said that because right. I think, you know, a lot of, in many cases, People get put off um, uh, with no fault of their own, but they get put off when they see that well, I don't have the educational backing or the the financial backing, sure. or, um, or or the I'm not in a system where I have access to these opportunities. But I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head that that's not the case. Anyone and everyone, provided the perseverance is there and maybe to a certain extent the educational background, opportunities are limitless. Absolutely, excellent, good. Um, now. What what else would you like the the audience to know um, when it comes to your message to them? If there's people out there that want to pursue the direction that you're 
you're going in. Right. You know, what, what message do so, you so have there are for them? Two main things that I sort of want to get into. First is the importance of education. So I'm a huge advocate of, of you know, education and, and education, equal education for both male and female, right? right? Given how things are changing in this rapidly evolving world that we live in, yes. everything is getting digitalized, the technological advances are immense, um, things are getting way more sophisticated than that were before 20, 30 years ago. Um, my advice is, of course, is that every child, whether it is a male or a female, needs to get educated. Whether it is, um, you know, because the kind of society we live in, there is this saying that, you know, um, the women will end up being a homemaker, so why should we invest in them? Right. I, I personally think that that's absolute nonsense. Um, women should be given equal opportunity to be educated because end of the day, it is them um, that will be your support. You know, the husband Absolutely. and wife support. Yes. They will be the ones to support you for bread earning. They will support you for raising a child. They will support you during your good days and your bad days. So why should we not give them equal opportunity to be educated? Mm. So my message is be educated. Whatever it is, big, small, but have a certain skill set that will allow you to benefit in the rapidly changing environment we live in. So that's the first part. Um, and the second part is, of course, given the scenario that I've, I've come across, many people think that there is only a single source of in inspiration. Right. People say, well, you know, this guy is rich. This guy is famous. This guy is a public figure. This guy is, is, is beautiful or handsome. Yeah. This guy is well connected. Right? Mm. So we can only draw motivation or inspiration via that. Mm. Okay. I think that's yeah. absolute not true, right. personally. Um, because it doesn't take one to have those particular qualities to be able to motivate people, to be able to, be able to inspire people. Any examples? Sure, you sure. Um, last month, yeah. I attended a, a fest called the Tech Fest 2.0. A huge uh, uh, a shout to brother Shokat Zahir Hussein, who was the main uh, organizer. He's okay. also the director of the Robotech Labs here in mm -hmm. Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. um, and under his leadership, I was able to, to see things that young Tanzanian local secondary students wow. that were able to produce items that are solutions in a very sustainable manner. How, so, old, how old were they? Um, so these students were, I think, Form 1 and Form 2 students, so looking at about 13, 14, 15 okay. years. Wow. That was okay. the, the age uh, right. category. Um, and may, maybe to give you a couple of examples yes, of what, yes, what they did. Yeah. So I came across three things that really touched me. And, and for me personally, that was like, wow. Yeah. You know, it left me uh, um, mesmerized. The first thing that they, they, they built was something called um, a menstrual pad uh, machine, right? So what does that mean? You know, when, when we go abroad, we, we go to Dubai, for instance, we insert a coin to this fridge yeah. that allows us to get a Coca-Cola. Like a example. vending machine. Like yeah. a vending machine, yes. right? They created a, of course, it was a cardboard uh, prototype. Right. They created this particular cardboard prototype where you can insert in 500 Tanzanian shillings and immediately a singular female sanitary pad was available. Now, okay. why is this important? There are two things to this. The first thing is that, of course, this is very handy. Imagine having this certain this kind of a thing at a female ward in, in, in a hospital mm. or yeah. the, the girls' washroom in, in the school or the even school. a public space for that right. matter, right? right? And second, it breaks this stereotype about the whole female hygiene menstruation. Ah, interesting. Right? Yes. I mean, we have to understand as males that if it was not for this particular menstrual cycle, right. we would not be here. <laughs> yeah, right? true. We would not be here. <laughs> yes. So people need to understand and desensitize themselves right. about you know, this stereotype that you know, we should not be talking about female menstruation. Mm. Right? So this particular prototype, I think, serves these two points. From 13-year-olds? From 13-year-olds. That, that is amazing. That were not rich, not well-connected, not established, nothing. What an example. They just yeah. got an opportunity and they were able to grab that opportunity. Right? Amazing. The Amazing. other thing that I, I, I was really, really uh, uh, impressed with was a blind man sensor stick. Right. So, of course, we know a, a, a blind stick, uh, yes. a blind person uses a stick to walk Correct. around so that he's able to understand the vicinity of things around him so he's able yes. to navigate, right? Yes, of course. Now, these guys created a sensor chip 
yeah. that is right at the bottom of the, of the blind man stick. And what that sensor does is it senses obstacles that are within a certain vicinity, so right. a couple of meters apart, and it sends vibration signals on the handle where the wow. person is holding the stick. Wow. Right? So imagine practical uses of this particular stick, especially in a place like Ooh, Tanzania. The list is Rough endless. roads, busy, busy roads. So the kind of things that these people were uh, able to, to perform and do was actually not only um, providing a solution, but a sustainable solution. Because yes. these things were created out of very ordinary, uh, uh, cheap, electronic items that are so available in the market. I, I am stunned. This is a, a solution to such a common problem. Absolutely. And, and it didn't take much. No, not at all. That incredible. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier on that you know, <coughs> technology is a big part of, um, of what you do. Right. So if, if, if you had a piece of advice for youngsters, you sure. know, we live in a world where sure. we're very technologically advanced. Sure. Um, uh, IT plays a big part in, in all aspects of, of life. What would you say to young people who are perhaps unsure of where they want to end up or what direction they want to go? Are there some fundamental skills that you think they should have regardless of the path they take? Yes. Um, of course, you know, like I said before, not everybody has a clear vision of what they want to end up being. Or Correct. what they end up, you know, they want to do yes. in life. Yes. But it's important for youngsters to understand that before you get into a particular subject to say, well, this is something I want to pursue, or this is something I want to see myself down 20, 30 years down the line, you need to build yourself with a skill set. And given the current scenario of how technology is working around yeah. the world, um, I personally feel people should learn coding. Ah, so this is a, a machine okay. learning programming language that comes in various languages and packages, right. Right. but it is very, very important for especially the youngsters to understand and learn coding as soon as possible. Amazing. Because coding is something that is applicable not only in health, not only in technology, not only in IT, yes. but in so many various ways Absolutely. that will then perhaps be an inspiration for these kids to say, well, okay, I've learned coding. Now I see a, a really amazing application of this particular uh, program that I created and I could create a mobile app. Right? Mm. That could have its own application. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Or I could do something for the hospital. Or I could do something for the genetic diagnosis. Oh, yeah. Or I could do something for the IT company. Right? So Absolutely. have that basic skill set while you're still thinking you're out. Correct. Amazing. Before we started filming, you talked a little bit about uh, moving back right. to Tanzania. Right. Um, I know you're currently in the Netherlands. Um, you're completing your PhD. Yeah. But I can only assume and I hope I'm not wrong, but if you were to continue your life there, you'd make a pretty handsome living. Um, you know, so to, to give that up and focus more in the long term on Tanzania and what you can do, not only for our community, but as a country, how did you come to that decision? Because I'm sure for a lot of people, when you start making a, a, a good living, you know, everything else is kind of secondary. This is sure. where I want to settle down. Right. Um, so when we talk about coming back to Tanzania, um, or if at least that's what I would like to do, yeah, um, this all started back in 2017, right? Because when I started my PhD back in the 20, 2014, 2015, right, I didn't know what mm. what my future would be. Of course, I always had the vision to come back and serve my country, always. Amazing. But I didn't know how soon, right? I didn't know when would be the right time to make that transition. I thought, well, let's finish a PhD, get a couple of postdocs under my belt, uh, maybe get to an associate professor position and then come back with right. all that experience and the grants. Um, but then I, I, the, the turning point for me was a conference I attended in Cairo, uh, in Egypt in 2017. Okay. And I, uh, so this was a conference that was organized by the Africa Society of Human Genetics. And over there, um, I really understood the population dynamics and the genetic research that was conducted on Africa. Mm. Now, let me, let me go a step back and explain you the basics of, of how these whole genetic processes work. You see, when I talked about being able to distinguish a patient from a normal person in terms of the kind of mutation they hold um, for a particular, you know, to say that that particular mutation causes this disease, right. you need to have a reference set you need to have a sufficient number of people 
from whom you have collected their DNA. Correct. And you have generated this database that's sort of a, a library, and then you're going to compare that particular person with a disease to that reference set. And it is only when multiple people with that disease have the same mutation, when compared to the reference set, there is the same difference is when you can actually conclude to say, well, this mutation causes this disease, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, going back to the Human Genome Project, the Human Genome Project started back in the 1990, and it was completed in 2003 under the leadership of uh, Professor Francis Collins, who was, uh, who's currently the director of the, the NIH. Um, what they did, so, and this is also the largest biological collaboration between global partners to create a reference data set for multiple populations mm -hmm. around the world. Sadly, of the 100% of the data, the African population represented only 2%. Wow. So you can imagine that there are severe consequences to this. First, if we do not have enough number of people sequenced, if we right. do not have enough number of people in that library, how sure are we <coughs> that a particular mutation from a patient is good to compare to those particular right. set uh, of, of libraries, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's this huge problem. Correct. And second, the African population, so Africa, so to speak, is the cradle of mankind, right? With over 300 languages spoken, with over 13 different indigenous populations, um, and the migration that happened around outside Africa, because of course the cradle of mankind is Africa. That means Absolutely. everybody at some point was an African. Yes. It is only much, much later that people started to migrate to Europe and mm. Asia and America and all of that stuff. Interesting. I didn't, right. I didn't know that. Okay. So it is very important to understand the diversity of African populations. Right. It is very important to understand that the building blocks of African indigenous people is different from someone from a European background. Interesting. Interesting. Right? Okay. But now if we are only going to do research using European populations, then we are not going to be able to provide sufficient evidence to say that this particular information is applicable to African populations. Got it. And that goes into diagnostics, that goes into prevention, that goes into therapeutics, that goes into drug production. And wow. so there was this pressing need. Now going back to that conference in, in Cairo, yes. right? So I met with a, a, a very brilliant mind, Dr. Siana Nkia, who uh, I co-founded the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics uh, based on that. Um, so in, in, in Cairo, we sat down and we realized, well, we do have the African Society of Human Genetics. And this is sort of an umbrella um, um, platform, Body, yeah. right? Um, where multiple countries in Africa who do have a genetic society can collaborate. And then there's, of course, uh, benefit of training, research, benefit of grants, benefit of attending conferences, you know, all of that stuff. And we realized Tanzania was not there. Mm. So Dr. Siana and I decided that that would be something that we would like to pursue. Have the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics formed and um, there are four main objectives of the society. We want to conduct genetic research in the country. We want to perform diagnostics as a routine procedure in the hospitals. So for instance, if you have malaria, you'd go and get yourself tested for malaria, right? In the hospital. Yeah. Now imagine having a genetic disease and then getting a genetic test done for that in the hospital. As a preventative measure. As a preventive measure, measure. or wow. for just recognizing the kind of drugs that will work or will not work for you. Right, right, right. yeah. Third is to actually prepare a curriculum, an educational curriculum for medical students health science students to understand the basics. So not only the theory, but also the lab side of whole genetics uh, field. Right. And lastly, to desensitize the public, to engage them, to make the public understand what is genetics? How can genetics benefit them? And therefore it is collectively that the voices of scientists and the cry from people will allow these two voices to join and then make an impact in terms of policy from the government. Right. right? Oh yeah, government so input has to be there. Of course, it's very yeah. important that the government Absolutely. is involved in this. So this was sort of the vision and the objectives of the society. Um, I'm going to use this platform to, 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 to say that we are uh, finally inaugurating our society at the Tanzania Health Summit in Dodoma on Amazing. the 27th and 28th of November That's this awesome. year. Yeah. Um, and as part of the, the Africa Society of Human Genetics, I'm a board member there, um, we were able to bid successfully for Tanzania to hold the next conference in wow. Dar es Salaam. 
So the year 2020, we are hosting the Africa Society of Human Genetics Conference that I attended in Cairo. Right. Now for the first time in, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, so, where we're going to expect about 500 to 800 delegates to join us. Wow, things are moving fast. I Absolutely. mean, your plate's full. <laughs> it is. Over the it's next, quite busy. Uh, over the next couple of years, I'm yes. guessing. Yes. Um, it, it's just so um, so stunning, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm amazed at everything you're saying. And there's so much I've learned in, in the last half hour or so. Um, all I can say is, you know, you, along with our audience, you know, you, you have our best wishes. Thank you. Um, and I'm hoping that your vision for this country and maybe the continent as a whole uh, one day is, is realized. Um, because I'm sure you've, you know, based on what you're saying, is you've, you've got amazing hopes and goals and to, to make a, a real difference. Uh, I guess, and uh, it is my hope that, that it all works out for you, and, and I'm sure the audience feels the same way as well. Thank you, um, I'm, from the bottom of my heart, I'm grateful that you, you took the time to come here today and, and share your story, and I'm hoping it has, it has inspired people watching to, inshallah, one day pursue the path that, that, you're, that you're on right. and, and you're continuing on. And, um, I'm so thankful. Thank you Thank for, you so much for coming. For I really you. appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. So this much. was this was excellent, um, and you. I hope our audience will will benefit. If you have any questions for a brother Mohammed Zahir, I will be putting his contact information uh, below on the screen. Uh, please feel free to reach out to him. He will be more than happy to to answer your questions and give you any guidance that you may require. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I know it was a little long, but I hope you enjoyed it. And inshallah, I will see you on the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.